Welcome everybody to the uh, Stern Seminar on What's Next in Banking. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, of Signature Bank, and the sharp decline in the equity values of several other banks indicate concerns about the health of the U.S. banking system. Outside the United States, the plunge in the share values of Credit Suisse and the takeover by UBS indicate that the concerns about banks aren't confined to the United States. Now, these developments are the results of several failures. Likewise, they raise many questions. What exactly happened and why? Are these simply the consequences of the end of easy money? What were the failures in risk management, of supervision, regulation, market, uh, and governance? What's different here from the run-up to the financial crisis in 2007-9? How should we evaluate the policy response so far? And what are the potential adverse consequences for the economy? What should be done? To answer these questions and many more, we have three eminent Stern professors on our panel today. Viral Acharya, Thomas Philippon, and Alexis Savov. I'm Dick Berner, and I will moderate the panel. Let me give you some housekeeping announcements first. Uh, as a reminder, we're live streaming tonight's event, so we welcome our viewers for, from wherever they are uh, in tuning in. In addition, a caption recording of the event will be available in a few days on the NYU Stern website. Press are in attendance, so tonight's event is certainly on the record, um, and uh, you all know what that means. And there's a standing mic in the center aisle for audience questions. Towards the end of our event, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so please start thinking about them now, and I'll curate them and let you know when to head to the mic. So here's our plan of attack. Each of these gentlemen will speak for about five minutes. Then they'll respond to questions from me, and you'll have a chance to ask questions if you're in the room. I want to mention that there is ongoing scholarship in these issues. First, professors Kim Schoenholz and Steve Cicchetti have posted a great piece on the topic on their blog, moneyandbanking.com, that I commend to your attention. Second, this event is certainly not the last word. For all I we're just saying, probably every university, every think tank in the country right now is doing similar seminars. Um, and we plan to write a stern white paper on the issue, much like our work following the financial crisis. The books that we produced then set a high bar for scholarship and advice, and they still resonate today. Many of the people involved in that are in this room besides the folks sitting next to me. These recent developments make it clear, however, there's much more to the story and, in fact, much more work to be done. So without further ado, Viral, you're up. Thank you. I'm just going to stand up so I can see what's on the slides over there. Uh, a very warm evening to all of you. Uh, two things make me very contemplative. Uh, one is classical Indian music, and the second is a banking crisis. Uh, so I'm in a fairly contemplative mood uh, over the last two weeks, and you will see some of that coming through. Uh, maybe there will be more questions than answers uh, as we go along. Uh, uh, Dick might have mentioned this, but uh, I was at the central bank in India, the central bank of India, from January 17 till July 19. And one thing I realized on the job there that when you're a professor, you usually get proved wrong by your students, if you're unlucky by the referee and the editors. Uh, but when you're a central banker, very often you get proved wrong by the markets. Uh, and something like that is perhaps going on right now. Okay, so uh, uh, what should be next for banks? Uh, where I'm going to build the talk towards is to say that we perhaps need to think about banks defending themselves and providing safety of deposits in that manner. So I'm going to push for raising the levels of bank capital without much ado uh, in order to provide private deposit insurance of as much quantity as we can in the present situation. So uh, there are many ways to interpret crises. Uh, in one view of the world, they are sunspots or wild swan events. Uh, a lot of the work we did after the global financial crisis and trying to understand several crises of the century before uh, seemed to suggest that perhaps these are not wild swan events. Maybe they are actually uh, sort of black swan events, but they are actually sort of white ducks, you know that there's a repeated pattern to what uh, is happening over time again and again. 
Uh, and one way we made sense of that at that time was that perhaps what's happening is that the financial sector, through a variety of distortions, has gotten used to creating tail risks. Uh, you know, this sort of what look like uh, black swan events, but are actually sort of white duck uh, events. And if you think about the economic theory underlying that, it could be because of a market failure, which is that maybe what banks do is about interconnectedness. If they provide liquidity to others, others can provide liquidity to others and so on. But they, they don't internalize this fact that, listen, my staying safe is actually a virtue for the system as a whole. And so you underinvest in the safety of the balance sheet that you are running. But of course, over time, we have, built a, we have built a very complex set of regulations. And these regulations can unfortunately fail. Uh, perhaps in the current context, one of the biggest regulations that we've been talking about is the fact that we have deposit insurance up to a certain size uh, of deposits. Uh, and uh, a, a fundamental issue with deposit insurance is that it's by and large not fairly priced. Uh, you know, right now, the, the size of the deposit insurance fund is about 1.26 percent of all uninsured of all insured deposits, which is about 10 trillion. Uh, you know that's a very small number. If you just do a back of the envelope calculation, even if you just go to the 30th largest bank in the United States, that starts looking like a very small size of the deposit insurance fund, which basically means you are not collecting enough premia to build up these funds to be of decent size in good times. Now, there's a new kid on the block that's like adding to all these distortions. Uh, and I think that's quantitative easing. Why? Because uh, when quantitative easing is undertaken by a central bank, we generally focus on the fact that the central bank is expanding its balance sheet. But it turns out, actually, that commercial banks are also expanding their balance sheet because the central bank is buying securities from the public or you know, the uh, other non-bank institutions at large, when they do that, you get a creation of un unsecured, uninsured bank deposits uh, into the banking system. So when QE is undertaken in a very big measure, actually the commercial bank balance sheets expand in a very big way. And unfortunately, all of that happens mostly with growth of uninsured deposits. Now, then when you undertake quantitative tightening, you try to reverse this a lot of the problems of these uninsured deposits start manifesting at that point. Now, what has all, all this to do with Silicon Valley banks? So I just want to show you three quick pictures to make sense of that, which is that one thing you observe is that post the pandemic, this bank grew at a very rapid pace. I won't go into specific numbers, but by any visual sense of appreciating these figures, you can see that the growth of assets is very large. That's in the blue bars. And that's very coincident with the growth of uh, the Silicon Valley IPOs. I want to stress this, that there's something happening on their asset side, their underlying franchise of corporate customers as well, which is linked actually to the growth of this balance sheet. On the right hand side, you see there then that this growth was actually supported by very low interest rate era. And in particular, that low interest rate era was coincident with quantitative easing, which made it very easy to grow with uninsured bank deposits over uh, that time. And of course, usually these low interest rate eras are associated with search for yield. And then you, know, you get the sort of problems we've been talking about that they ended up being very heavy in mortgage-backed securities and so on. Now, why is this an issue? Uh, the issue is because the deposit growth, as you can see, is very high for two years, starting in 2020 until beginning of 2021. But there's already a slow run at work during 2022 itself. Actually, the bars are already negative of about $10 billion already in two quarters of 2022. And then, boom, in 2023, just on one day, you get this $42 billion big run. Uh, and this is how a lot of banks fail. First, they are bleeding slowly, and then they fail very fast. Uh, now, why do the assets matter? Uh, here you see that actually a lot of the mortgage-backed securities that they held because of quantitative tightening and especially the, uh, the very sharp increase in interest rates are losing value. So capital of various banks has not been marked fully. Uh, 
Many of them would be at very lower, much lower levels of capital if you had marked their books properly. And you can see that on the extreme right-hand side in a chart from FDIC, that actually unrecognized losses on assets are actually very, very large. Now, usually what these scale of losses do is that they create a wrinkle of doubt in the depositor's mind. They may be very risk averse. And uh, either because there are other better alternatives, such as higher yielding money market fund accounts or safer banks, you start seeing a flight of deposits, which can be very quick in, in, in the modern world. OK. So, so of course, the problem that has happened with Silicon Valley banks seems to be a problem with many other banks. Regional banks are being discussed a lot. Larry White, who is uh, standing at the back, has this classic paper on regional banks always having very high commercial mortgage-backed securities or commercial real estate exposure. So again, that's an asset franchise that's not doing very well right now, and that could very well lead to wrinkle of doubt in the mind of the depositors of these regional banks. So where do we, what do we do with all this stuff? We have many bank failures already. Uh, rescues are being attempted. One proposal is that we should backstop it all. Uh, and I'm going to actually go almost on the other end of it, as you will see. I'm going to go a little bit uh, counterintuitive or counterproposal to that, uh, that view of the world. And the reason is because it helps stem runs. It prevents the depositors from immediately running out if you say you are all backstopped. But it doesn't restore confidence in the fundamental business of the bank or in its ability to absorb further shocks. Okay, which is that you, know, you can't do something about their assets on the basis of simply guaranteeing deposits. And you can't ensure for sure that there'll be no further wrinkles of doubt in the mind of the depositors. The only way you can do that is if in all states of the world, regardless of what the fiscal capacity of the government is, you can always backstop no matter what the scale of your deposits is. So as I said, you have about $20 trillion of total deposits. 10 of it is insured, 10 of it is uninsured. If we have to guarantee it all, you need to have confidence in minds of depositors that $20 trillion of liabilities can be backstopped by the US government at the moment you demand your money, regardless of what the rest of the economic situation is. So I think that's, that's very tough. I, I don't think any government, not even the US government, can give that kind of credibility to a depositor in the banking system. So, so, so what should we do? Uh, we think that some of what happened at the time of the great financial crisis can guide us. There, what was done was it was recognized that there were many asset losses on mortgage-backed securities at that time. Banks were already having runs. Similar measures as the ones we have right now were tried to first backstop the creditors. That didn't work. And ultimately, even after backstopping the system, what the regulators did was to do a stress test recognize where the losses are, be transparent about them to investors, and get banks to provide their own capital bearing capacity so that creditors didn't have to ask the question, should I pull my money out? Okay, The strength was ultimately built on the balance sheet of each entity coming out of these stress tests. In my view, that is exactly what we should do right now, or at least consider doing and debate its pros and cons. And when you do that, I would actually go to the other extreme and say, assume that all deposits might run. The bank should be right now cap capitalized, in my view, to a point of, say, about 8% to 10% level of capital after the stress test. But when you do the stress test, you should recognize that you might have to pay off a very big chunk of these uh, deposits. Now, whether that's 50% of insured deposits being included while doing the stress test as runnable, whether it's 100%, that becomes a matter of regulatory choice. Last point here, and I think this is important because it will raise also an interesting debate, is that uh, at NYU Stern, we developed a measure after the crisis called S-Risk. It tries to predict what's the level of undercapitalization of an entity. Uh, without getting into specifics, this is for the top 10 banks, which are all under trouble. And you can see that the S risk was actually rising for many of these entities upwards from zero. 
In some cases, even in 2022, when the deposit outflow started in many of these banks and rising very precipitously in the first quarter, especially in March. Uh, so the picture I want to paint is that this is not a sunspot. This is not a black swan event. This was a slow run that then became a very fast run. And so uh, to sum it up, uh, uh, the history of banking crises and the history of recent crises seems to suggest that banks are leveraging themselves up to earn carries in good times, and then you get some aggregate shock, in this case an interest rate shock, perhaps a shock to the Silicon Valley, a shock to commercial real estate, and then the carry trade uh, sort of goes belly up. Uh, you get a slow run first and then a fast run. What's the solution? You should raise private bank capital. First, you have to market honestly. Uh, that means you have to stress it for even further losses. Uh, and then you have to get banks to raise capital. I'm sure there'll be discussion about how you do that for entities where there isn't much capital raising capacity left in the first place. Let me stop here. Great. Thanks, Thanks. for all. Toma. All right. Thank you uh, all for coming. So <clears throat> I'm following up on Viral. So I want to tell you a bit more about the specifics of F uh, SVB. When I first read the news, I really felt like I was back in the 80s. So that's m one of my favorite movies from the 80s. For the, those of you in the room who are too young, that's a good movie you can watch. Um, so this is like an old-fashioned banking crisis. Okay? This is something we've seen in the past, and in particular in the early 80s, with, with a twist that I'll, I'll discuss uh, later. So um, one thing to keep in mind, usually to kill a bank, you need two mistakes. The first one, you survive, but if you make two big mistakes at the same time, then you go down. So you can have a bank with a stable deposit base investing in long-term assets uh, and potentially making some losses when interest rate change, and that's okay. Or you could have uh, a bank that has a lot of cash, no duration, no interest rate exposure, and then um, that bank could survive a run. But you can't have two at the same time. You can't have a lot of duration risk, like SVB had, together with uh, an unstable uh, deposit franchise. When you make the two mistakes at the same time, then you go down. That's what happened to them. Something interesting there that Alexi will talk more about uh, afterwards is um, how do we think about you know, what's the business model of banking and how does SVB fit in that uh, business model of banking? So um, recent research suggests that probably most of the value of banks, or more than half, uh, is tied to their deposit franchise. So if you want a, th a simple model of banking, start with the liability side. Start with the fact that most banks have a well-established deposit franchise. So that's how they raise their, uh, their money. Um, and then they figure out how to invest it. Of course, they also invest in their loan-making franchise by having you know, good uh, loan officers, credit rating, and stuff like that, and good uh, connection with businesses. But in some big picture sense, you know, the deposit franchise comes first. So if that's the business model, then mo most or many banks at least uh, will tend to have a well-diversified deposit franchise and then you know, allocate their loans accordingly. Now, SVB in that specific sense is very unusual because it's not a bank that traditionally had a very strong deposit franchise. The thing that made SVB successful was their loan-making franchise, specifically geared towards uh, startups in Silicon Valley. And then what they did is they kind of levered this loan-making franchise to create a large pool of deposits. But the problem is when they did that, they did not get a diversified deposit base. They got a highly concentrated deposit franchise made of mostly, uh, well, some high-income uh, individuals, but also a lot of corporate uh, cash accounts. Okay? And the problem with these corporate cash accounts is that there are two, really. One is that they vastly exceed the $250,000 uh, insurance. So that means most of it is uninsured. And the second is that, as Viral showed you earlier, the decrease in deposit at SVB started uh, last year. Why? Well, because these startups were burning money. So in fact, it was a deposit franchise that would always run down. Because you would make the loan, they would start their funding, they would deposit in the bank, but as they burn through cash, uh, because most startups do that when they grow, 
they would withdraw their deposits. Okay? So it was not at all a stable deposit franchise. Okay? So I think these are important to keep in mind um, to understand why SVB ended up that way. So what happened next is, of course, the market started looking for who is next. So they were looking around for banks that look like SVB in the sense of having relatively um, high exposure to interest rate risk and relatively high fraction of uninsured deposits. Okay, and we had to get the usual suspect on the list, maybe a few, a few more today, but you know, it's still not very many. Um, okay, so what's the twist with, with SVB? So I said it was like a 1980 movie. I think it, it is you know, mostly a 1980 movie, but with Twitter. And so just to keep a, in mind like some order of magnitude, um, in fact, I'm going to start even earlier than that. So um, in the early 1980s, the Federal Reserve, to fight inflation, increased interest rate very quickly. Sounds familiar, right? Except they went to 20%, right? We went to 4.5%. So it was vastly more. Um, and then uh, smaller banks called selling and loans got into trouble because of that. That crisis, which was fundamentally very similar to what we're seeing, played out over several years. Okay, so years. Fast forward to 2009, Washington Mutual, which was the largest bankruptcy uh, of a bank in the US, they were also bleeding deposit roughly 16 billion in 10 days. Okay, so faster, now it's like in days. And uh, SVB was 40 billion, a bit more actually than 40 billion, in 42. eight hours. So clearly there, the twist is that, you know, uh, with social media, if your deposit base is uninsured, undiversified and on Twitter, then you're in trouble. Okay? <laughs> so what can we do? Well, I mean, before we start thinking, so my point is, I don't think it's rocket science, and I don't think it's very complicated. It's just a 1980s movie. Okay? So we have regulations, and I, I would argue that what we're going to see over the next few weeks is they, by and large, they work, except they were not implemented. So we have something called Basel III, which was created after 2013, well, after the Great Crisis, but then you know it takes a bit of time to agree uh, to put all the regulators around the world in agreement. So it started to be implemented in 2013. If you look at uh, the EU, essentially all banks, that is, all the large ones and the vast majority of medium-sized ones, they comply with, bio, with Basel III, <coughs> including uh, pretty tight liquidity ratios. And my sense is all of these banks are going to be just fine. Uh, I don't think they, they have the same interest rate exposure. In fact, I know they don't. And why? Well, because they were constrained by the regulations. Now, in the US, all the big banks are covered by these regulations. The ones that were exempt are the regional banks. So perhaps it should not be so surprising that these are the ones that are uh, in trouble. So of course, the next question is, why were the regional banks exempted from this? And I, I'm sure we'll talk about that in the second half. Great. Thank you, Alexi. All right. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to follow up on uh, Tomas' discussion of banks' uh, business model, in a sense, but more broadly, not about SVB specifically. And I'll talk mostly about uh, how banks deal with interest rates. What's their relationship to interest rates? Because I think that's really at the core of what's happening and the risk going forward. Uh, so here's the basic problem. Um, starting in January 21, uh, the Fed started to raise interest rates aggressively to fight inflation, uh, bringing the funds rate up to about 4.5%. Uh, the long-term rate, which, uh, as those of you who took my class know, reflects expectations of future short rates, increased by about 2.5%. Uh, now, why is this a problem? Well, banks hold about $17 trillion of long-term loans and securities, um, and the average duration on those is about four years. So what this means is that when rates go up by 1%, the value of these loans and securities goes down by 4%. And since rates, long-term rates have risen by 2.5%, you can do a very simple calculation where you multiply the increase in the interest rate of 2.5 by the duration of 4 and by the total size, 17 trillion, and you find that banks are sitting on an implied loss of about $1.7 trillion across their whole balance sheet. Uh, so there are two things about this number that are important. First, notice that the number is not hidden. It's not uh, hiding in the accounting. It's not complicated. It's not hard to calculate. It took one uh, line on this slide. Um, the second thing to notice is that it's a very large number. It's not just a lot of dollars, but it's also very large relative to the uh, total size of bank capital, which is about $2.2 okay? uh, 
Now, you might think with these numbers, um, one place you would find that would be very worried about this would be the stock market, right? Bank stock uh, should be uh, uh, down. Uh, but in fact, what you see that's very interesting is this is the KBE bank stock index going back to the start of the rate hiking cycle in 2021 normalized to 100, you see that uh, since then, uh, bank stocks are pretty much flat through February of this year. If anything, they're slightly up, but increased a little bit and a little bit down, roughly flat over this period during the aggressive hike in interest rates. Stock market really doesn't seem to have been too worried. Of course, now in March, when we have a banking crisis on our hand, the index is down 25%. Uh, but the question is, why is that? If there are these big losses that banks are sitting on, why isn't the stock market more worried? It's actually a simple answer that comes back to banks' business model and has to do with the deposit franchise. As Tomas said, what, banks, what makes banks really special is the fact that they issue deposits. Now, deposits are important because people really like deposits. Deposits are very convenient. You can make your payments with them. People like them also for their safety. Because they like them so much, people are willing to accept very low interest rates on deposits, far below the market rate. And so this is very interesting for banks because it means that when the Fed raises rates, banks make a lot more money on deposits than they did when, the, when rates were low. There's a number known as the so-called deposit beta, which measures how much deposit rates go up for every 1% increase in the funds rate. The deposit beta has been around 0.2. So that means deposit rates only go up by about 20 basis points for every 100 basis point interest rate increase. In other words, banks capture about 80 basis points of the 100 uh, for every 100 bips increase in the funds rate. So that's a pretty big number. Here's a chart that shows how it's been going lately. Uh, back in 2021, when the funds rate was at zero, deposit rates were also at zero. Banks weren't making any money on deposits. Since then, the funds rate has increased sharply to four and a half, as I said before. And the deposit rates you can see here have basically done nothing. Interest checking, I mean, it's a joke, is at six basis points average rate across the country. Uh, savings deposits, which are the largest chunk, there's $12 trillion of this stuff, are only paying 0.35%. Uh, CDs, which are the highest cost, are at about 1.3. And so the difference between the red line, the black line, and the colored lines, those are the spreads that banks are earning on deposits, have gotten very, very large. Uh, in fact, this is not new. Like Tomas said, it's a 1980s movie. It might even be a 1970s, 60s, 50s, and 40s movie. It's been going on for a long time. Interest rates have moved around. Yes, if you're excited about the current rate hike, wait till you see what Volcker did in the early 80s. But the more interesting thing is that the, despite that, despite the huge gyrations in interest rates, bank net interest margins were just remarkably stable during this whole period. And that's and their ROA, that's the blue line there. And that's because of this behavior of deposit rates. And so that's something key uh, to keep in mind. Now, uh, this means that deposits effectively provide banks with a hedge to an increase in interest rates. And it's a pretty big hedge. Uh, basically, because deposits are really big, $17.5 trillion total, the average deposit rate has stayed quite low, 0.9%. These are, these are all February numbers, the latest available. And so that means that banks are earning a spread of about 3.6% per deposit dollar per year. Uh, so on a base of $17.5 trillion, that's $630 billion of increased income relative to when interest rates uh, were at zero. And so you can see this is a very large number and therefore a pretty nice big hedge with respect to the rise of interest rates. About three years' worth of this much income is enough to offset the losses that we calculated on the first slide, uh, basically because deposits went from being unprofitable to being extremely profitable. And so this explains why the stock market uh, wasn't worried uh, through February of 2023. It's this offset between the deposit franchise and the asset side that stabilizes banks' cash flows uh, with respect to interest rate risk. Now, it's not February anymore, it's March. And so there are important risks now that uh, we have going forward. And, all the, and those risks uh, really stem down to the fact that the deposit franchise, that's an intangible asset. It's an asset that is only there, the deposits only provide that hedge if deposits stay in the bank, if the bank can earn that spread. If depositors leave, can't earn the spread, the deposit franchise is gone. And so there are two risks to that. Uh, the first, of course, is that depositors may run if they're uninsured. As Tomas said, in the case of SVB, that was clearly a pretty big factor. And the thing about bank runs is they destroy the franchise value. They destroy the deposit franchise, the hedge is gone, uh, and the bank becomes insolvent. Another risk that might apply more broadly and a little bit less abrupt is that it could be that deposit betas increase going forward. The banks might have to pay higher rates. Uh, if, for example, if depositors sort of wake up and start looking for higher interest rate uh, alternatives out there. Uh, 
if the positive beta is kind of double from 0.2 to 0.4, uh, you would find that only about one third of the asset side loss uh, is offset by the increase uh, in deposit spread. So that's uh, a risk. And it's a risk that is very sort of disproportionate between different kinds of banks. It's much larger for the regional banks um, uh, because if you look at what's happening to deposits, the ones that are leaving the, the, the regional banks, they're going into the big banks. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the big banks don't really see a big increase in beta. Uh, maybe even their betas would fall, but it's the regional banks that potentially face uh, a bigger risk from that. And so the key thing to focus on, at least for me going forward, is the deposit franchise. The loans and the securities with respect to interest rates, it's relatively transparent and relatively easy to calculate. You just need to know the duration and how much interest rates have gone up. It's a deposit franchise, this intangible thing that is very key, and the risks to that that I think are going to be very important. Thank you. OK, great. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Um, and I'm going to ask a bunch of questions that fall into three buckets. Um, and some of them uh, have certainly been alluded to already in what we've discussed. The first group relates to risk management. Um, and uh, I'll extend that to uh, you know, the relationship between banks and their supervisors. We obviously regulate and supervise banks in the financial system because we recognize the potential for market failure, which is what we've been talking about here, and because we want to protect uh, several groups of people. We want to protect consumers, we want to pr protect investors, um, and we want to protect uh, the public at large. One of the reasons that people trust private money, which are bank liabilities, is that they think it can be readily exchanged for public money. But as Viral said, you know, backing up $10 trillion or even $20 trillion of deposits is a pretty big guarantee. Uh, for any government. So the first question I have for you guys is, what needs to change in bank risk management? And Alexi, maybe I'll start with you because you're talking about the fact that maybe the deposit betas are not what the risk managers thought they, uh, they look like, but everybody else is welcome to jump in. Yeah, I think the, the key issue there is the increase uh, in uninsured deposits with a low deposit beta. So what do I mean by that? It used to be that uninsured deposits were large time deposits. They basically paid the competitive rate. And so banks knew that they would have to pay the funds rate one for one on those. And so they used to lend uh, short term uh, floating against that. The, the thing that's increased recently is these uh, corporate checking accounts that from an interest rate perspective are extremely insensitive, but from a, a runnability perspective are extremely runnable. And so uh, risk management is going to have to address this. You now have a trade-off where on the one hand, uh, because they're interest insensitive, you want to lend long against them. But on the other hand, they're runnable. And I think that's going to uh, make uh, uh, for a very hard trade-off for bank risk managers. Because you can't just say, like, OK, let's go super short then against those deposits. Because you run into the problem then that if interest rates go down, you're going to have insolvent banks from the fact that they won't be able to cover their operating costs. One thing I didn't talk about is that running a deposit franchise is expensive. Banks spend about 2% uh, per year on average on their branches and all the stuff that people love about banks. If interest rates drop and everything you had was in cash, uh, you're going to have banks uh, suffering on that side. They'll be um, uh, unable to meet their operating costs. So, so that's, that's, that's what makes this a, a tough thing uh, for risk managers. Do you want thoughts? <clears throat> Well, I think, well, uh, to continue with what I was saying in my slides, I think the first thing is to apply the regulations that were decided globally. Um, and I think that would be a good start. So I, I'm not sure we need to invent a lot of new regulations. So if you look at the way we do stress testing for liquidity uh, for big banks, we try to take uh, these, uh, all these forces into account. So, you know, like if you have a term deposit uh, checking account, if it's corporate versus uh, uh, household, they are treated differently in uh, liquidity stress testing. So I think that uh, what we should be doing, and the banks that have either done that by themselves or been forced by their regulators to, uh, to do it that way, are doing pretty well. Um, you know, the SVB chose to have that exposure, and the puzzling fact is why the regulators couldn't you know, act earlier than, than, than they did. For all? Yeah. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I've been trying to think about ways of marrying sort of my intuition about crises with the language that uh, Alexi and Toma were using. And I think the way I would put it is that, see, it's the bank's job to generate a stable PNL every quarter, 
And I think from that bank standpoint, it makes a lot of good sense to just see the deposit costs over the last year or something like that and assume in a world of reasonable stability that will just carry on. So the, assume that the deposit beta is stable. So to just give you an analogy, we had a lot of broker dealers fail at the time of global financial crisis. They, they had models for valuing their mortgage-backed securities. What, what were they using to calculate value at risk? They were just using the last quarter volatility. But that doesn't mean that they can keep generating that stable carry quarter after quarter after quarter because the situation would change, the volatility would rise. And I think what the risk management of the bank needs to be incentivized to do is that they have to entertain the possibility that the volatility, which has been low over the last very stable period, can actually have a tail risk and it may increase very suddenly. The same way in the language of the deposit franchise, I would say the risk managers need to be made to internalize the risk that the deposit beta may actually not be that stable. It can actually increase in these tail risk scenarios and then suddenly all sort of goes loose. Uh, and how do you do that? I think the only way out is to do a stress test. And uh, sort of one point of departure I would have with banks having been very stable in their deposit franchise would be that of course, in the past, whenever the banks would have had runs, we have actually not had them have runs. We keep backstopping them. So for example, we had the Intercontinental Bank, which was going to be a big failure in 1984. We stabilized them, and then that gave an implicit too big to fail guarantee to the banking system at that time. You can think about that in part as actually having seen a high deposit beta in the counterfactual, which didn't get materialized in data. And then, of course, the rest of the time, the banking system continues working as though the deposit beta is flat. They keep generating a carry. And then the next time you have a blow up, you backstop it again and so on. So I think to me, the risk management struggle here is really to get banks to function as though the stable carry that they generate in normal times is actually on the basis of a tail risk. That's a huge cost on the rest of the system when the tail risk materializes. So how should they do the counterfactual stress test exercises where they don't assume that the franchise is going to work in stress scenarios as though it is in normal times? I think to me, that's the real risk management challenge for the regulators at least. That's certainly one of them. And having spent 30 years on the street and worked with regulators uh, on that time and then 15 years uh, in regulation, um, you know, one old saying is the road to hell is paved with positive carry. Um, and so that's something that risk managers always need to be aware of. The other thing on the deposit franchise uh, is that, uh, you know, we keep hearing that uh, essentially depositors who are uninsured are making a, uh, an unsecured loan to a, a very leveraged uh, uns uh, creditor and, and uh, counterparty. And I think that's something that people need to take aware of on the deposit side when they're thinking about the risks when they deposit money on an uninsured basis. So one of the things we try to do in, is not just regulate banks, but we also try to supervise them to make sure they're doing the right things, both regarding um, you know, uh, how they operate normally and how they would operate under very dire or what we call circumstances of material distress so that we think about resolving them or essentially putting them out of business so they don't uh, threaten the taxpayer. And this is happening. For example, however, press reports indicate that the Fed in San Francisco was issuing notices to uh, SVB, among others, uh, notices called matters requiring attention. That's something that you need to do uh, for more than a year, but the supervisors took no action in response to those. And what we see is that we need more active supervi supervisory actions to go ahead and make sure the banks are doing the right thing. Uh, I might ask, are, are the Swiss and British regulators, um, you know, by finding buyers for troubled institutions, are they doing it better? That's still an open question. Um, but supervisory failure, you know, is clearly uh, an issue, and I think everybody agrees with that. Let me turn to the policy response. What was right and wrong about the policy response? We talked about backstopping, but can we I, all agree. I, I do want to ask one before we move on. Yeah. On the supervision. Supervision. Yeah, yeah. So, because I think that's, you know, 
So the banks with more than $50 billion of assets were supposed to be subject to the Basel III requirement that includes uh, all the stress on liquidity. And these are big stresses, right? So uh, the big banks, like think of JP Morgan here, think of, I don't know, like BNP Paribas in Europe. A lot bigger than 50. They have, uh, yeah, but they have about uh, $400 billion in cash or cash equivalent. And by the way, uh, these banks hedge out the interest rate risk on these, yes, they uh, do. On these liquidity. Okay? So th there is a reason why deposits are leaving f to go to these banks. And it's not just because they are too big to fail. It's because they've also been better regulated on the liquidity side. So the question is, why is that that did not happen to uh, SVB and some others? Well, the first is that these guys lobbied like crazy to move the threshold from 50 to 250 billion. So they would not be subject to the same requirement. Okay? And so when you ask why was supervision inefficient, there are two parts. One is, yes, I think there was, there's, clearly there has to be an investigation in the Fed for why um, more actions were not taken earlier. But the thing is, these banks managed to convince uh, Congress and some regulators to exempt them from these requirements. Now, once they're exempt, it's a lot harder to force them to do something. Because if you violate your LCR ratio, boom, there's no discussion. That's it. You have to satisfy it immediately. If it's pure supervision, then the regulators say, please do it, please do it again, and oh, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna be mean to you if you don't do it. But that can drag on forever, it drags on for a year. See, that's very different from having to satisfy the LCR ratio, period. And if you don't do it, then you're in real trouble immediately. So I think that's where the failure was. So I'm glad you raised that. Point? Yep. Like, so so my, my experience with supervision is that bank supervisors get very captured by the bank that they are supervising. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an analogy from my Reserve Bank of India experience. So there it's required by FIAT that a public sector bank, and in India there are many, have actually a member of the Reserve Bank of India on its board. And the whole idea of this mechanism was that this, they would actually keep the bank in check. And what we found in our board of financial supervision was that whenever our, the Reserve Bank of India's own employees who were on the boards of these banks, they would come in the bank meetings, they would really be batting for the bank because they were so cognitively captured by what was happening in that bank. So, so my own uh, preference would be to not, not assume that supervision is going to work well, even if we had, like in this case, it might have worked well, but I would not put my eggs into supervision because I think they get, cognitively very aligned with the bank that they are supervising. Uh, I think you just need a defense mechanism that is in the liability structure of the banks, in my view. It can't be something that's left to a handful of people and expect that they're going to walk in and do the right compliance. I think that's putting too much confidence in a group of bank supervisors, in my view. So I, I think I, we can agree that we need both, all yeah, right? Probably, and, yeah. and you have to have you know, both the, the legislation, the laws, you have to have the regulations, and you have to have the supervision to enforce the laws. So all those things are necessary. And as Tomas said, you know, we most, most of us think that we don't want uh, a one-size-fits-all approach to financial regulation. Uh, but the question is how do we, you know, balance uh, not having that um, with making sure that the regulations and the supervision uh, are tailored to the, the risk. So not only in 2018 did we see a rollback uh, of the regulations, but we also saw the implementation of that by the Federal Reserve um, that was you know, pushing the envelope on rolling those things back. So for example, one of the things that didn't happen was banks like SVV were not included in stress tests for three years running, uh, in part because they only required them to do it every two years and in COVID, in the pandemic, they exempted certain banks from the requirements. So there was no stress testing externally of SVB. Um, and part of the, the other story is the resolution planning uh, that has to be done for banks. In other words, what has, happens when banks get into serious trouble? Shouldn't we figure out a way to uh, wind them down without um, putting the burden on the taxpayer? Um, and we have a mechanism for that. Uh, but we don't use that mechanism adequately. And my question for, say, Thomas would well, be... Well, it's more that actually they... What's that? Part of the... Part of the <laughs> it's just that they were not required to have one. Because they were under the, the, the limit, 
So the two main consequences Correct. under the limit is you don't have this liquidity stress test that you're satisfied. And you don't have a resolution plan. You don't have a resolution planning, which doesn't mean they would. So that's not the thing that would have prevented them from being a mess in the first place. It would have made the resolution a lot easier. Or if you want, in what you were saying earlier, Dick, it would have made it a lot more likely that we could have found a buyer over the weekend if they had had uh, res uh, recovery planning. Exactly right. Because if they had wound down the bank and then kept the parts of the, big, of the bank that were really um, viable franchises, maybe they had a deposit franchise, they had an asset franchise, they had a business model that worked, you get rid of and resolve the parts of the bank that don't work, um, then you have a much better chance of selling the parts uh, that are likely to work. So all those things uh, are big questions uh, and to Varel's point, I think that's a question of whether you create conf how you create confidence in the business model and in the banking system. Yeah, uh, just, Thomas made one point which I think is very important, at least in the context of Silicon Valley Bank, which is that they were very concentrated even on their asset base, which is really sort of all just Silicon Valley stuff. And in fact, what you see is that they were bundling their, all their products. So they were effectively asking their corporate customers that if you want a credit line from me, you have to actually bring your deposit back to me. Okay? And so what this meant was that when they lost their deposit, they actually also lost all of their corporate activity at the same time. So in, in a way, your entire franchise of deposits, as Alexi is saying, and then also your asset franchise, which is how are you generating other kinds of sort of non-MBS kind of revenues, that's also leaving you because actually now the line of credit is also moving to another business at the same time. So. Right. So one of the things that we think about um, that relates to this is if we were to toughen the regulations for mid-sized banks, and it sounds like most of you feel that's appropriate, then would that promote more regulatory arbitrage? In other words, would their business go off to the less regulated parts of the financial system uh, something I've written a lot about, and, uh, and you guys have written about it as well. Is that a risk, and what do we need to do about it? Any thoughts about that? I would say that um, it's definitely the pattern, uh, like you said. Uh, I think it goes down to the, the fact that people do like deposit-like instruments. Um, I think the need for something that um, is, is like a deposit, useful for making payments, is going to be there no matter what. And so that's one of the challenges uh, because if you, um, if you do require banks to essentially cut back on deposits by having to uh, have more capital, it does mean that it's more likely to, mi to migrate somewhere else. Um, and, um, and in the past, that, that has led to, uh, to problems. Uh, the other question becomes immediately is if banks lose stable deposit funding, relatively interest insensitive deposit funding, they will also provide less uh, long-term fixed rate credit to the economy. That's important. Um, firms uh, demand uh, long-term credit, whether it's for commercial real estate, uh, whether it's for other purposes. Uh, borrowers like to, to have it. And so uh, there are implications then for the allocation of credit to the economy. Uh, I mean, obviously, in the short run, we could uh, end up with a credit crunch. I think that's kind of the, the, the concern in the short run. Uh, but in the long run, it, it could mean more expensive long-term credit. Um, whether that's uh, you know, worth it or not, of course, depends on the regulation, whether we fully internalize the externalities that Virao is talking about. But that's the kind of trade-off uh, that we face. So a follow-up question on that. There's a lot of talk now about guaranteeing all deposits. And Viral uh, made clear what the challenges are to do that. But still, there's a lot of talk to do that. Uh, what are the pros and cons of, of guaranteeing all deposits? Maybe, Alexia, I'll start with you. So the big thing, I think, actually, is something that, that, that Tama pointed out, which is that at least the crisis we're having right now, um, a lot of deposits are just moving from one bank to another. And the question then becomes not so much do we need to backstop all of them or how expensive that would be. It becomes whether it's important that they're moving. Uh, obviously, for the depositor's perspective, it might be less convenient if they have to bank with a branch that's a little bit farther. But that part seems pretty easy. The question is the lending relationships that those regional banks had. They seem to be very important for things like commercial real estate uh, and, and other kind of uh, uh, lending. Uh, those relationships might get ruptured. And the question is, can a JP Morgan, a Wells Fargo, can they step in and take over that supply of, of long-term credit or not? Uh, I think we will see. 
Uh, but in the interim, if, that, if, if there is a big disruption, if there is a big credit crunch, that could be pretty costly. And so that would then make you err on the side of trying to, provide, trying to prevent a run uh, uh, on those banks. So what do you think about the chance for a credit crunch, Tama and Varel? Um, oh, no, that's going to be... Uh, I mean, I think that the... <clears throat> well, the first thing to keep in mind, exactly as Alexei was saying, is the, the money doesn't leave the system. It stays. It's recycled either directly in other banks or via money market funds, which typically then again goes back to the banking system as a wholesale funding. The issue with the second way of recycling the money is it comes back more expensive, which is exactly what Alexia was showing you. Like, you know, if you keep your deposits, you keep paying them peanuts, and then you make the, the spread. If they leave you and come back as wholesale funding, uh, they're going to come back at market rates. So that creates a, you know, an income issue for, for the banks. I think that's the, the most likely uh, problem in the short term. Whether that's going to play out or not, I think it's too early to tell. Um, as for the credit crunch, well, part of that is going to depend. I mean, yes, it's likely, that, so it's likely that activities that are heavily exposed to regional banks are going to have relatively less credit going forward. I think that's very clear. And so it seems very unlikely that commercial real estate will be booming over the next 12 months. I think that's a safe bet. Um, now, whether the whole economy slows down, well, now you have to go back to the Fed. Because the Fed is watching this. They were supposed to hike by 50 basis points at their next meeting. Now they are thinking, OK, we, and the, the, the reason they, they wanted to do that was to slow down the economy, right? To slow down aggregate demand, to slow down inflation. Now, the crisis, however unfortunate, did part of that for them. OK, so financial conditions have tightened. So now they have to reassess and think about whether they want to raise by 50, mm, probably not. Zero, that we perceive as a sign of weakness on the inflation. So I think the likely outcome is, I would guess, 25 to be in between. Um, but that's part of the equation, right? So in theory, the Fed does not want a credit crunch. You, it still wants a slow, uh, like a smooth landing. They're going to take into account the tightening coming from that crisis. Uh, and they will adjust their path for their own interest rate accordingly. The tricky part there is more, it's, not the, it's the uncertainty. It's not the average effect, it's the uncertainty. The problem of a financial crisis like that, that, that we've seen, is if you want to turn that into something for the Fed, you have to translate SVB plus signature plus a few others equal how many basis points of tightening? Is it 25? Is it 50? Is it 75? So that's the big uncertainty that they have. And so that uncertainty means it's going to be harder to precisely manage the lending of the economy. So I think we might get a credit crunch overall, but that would be more by mistake than by design. Farrell? Yeah, uh, so I think there are three scenarios possible in my view, uh, uh, at least based on my experience of financial crises, is that if the Fed actually gets its act together, uh, including with other regulators and the government, I think there's a way to recapitalize the system uh, restore the confidence of the depositors, uh, and then actually things can come back to where they were, so to speak, uh, you know, where we are not too worried about uh, sort of everything falling apart and Fed can sort of stick to its inflation targeting mandate. There's a second outcome, which is where you let this reallocation of uh, deposits happen from the weaker banks to the safer banks. Uh, as Toma and Alexi mentioned, maybe there's a loss of some relationships along the way. Maybe some small businesses can't really move around. There's some adverse election issues in lending to them, et cetera. And you would actually get some loss of banking uh, franchise in terms of not getting the right levels of credit creation. There's a third solution, which I think is the really bad one, but I think which I want to put on the table as a possibility, which is that where you leave the banking system undercapitalized, but you actually say that all depositors of weak banks are stable. Okay? Historically, whenever this has been done, this has been done in Japan, it was done in Europe after the 2007-8 crisis, it's routinely done in emerging markets like China and India. You get zombie banks, they have no capital, but they have been backstopped by their governments and the regulators and they basically do a ton of bad lending. They lend to worse borrowers. The Bank of Cyprus, uh, which was an undercapitalized bank in 2012, they bet the entire house on Greek debt, even when Greece was actually completely blowing up. Why did they do that? 
because they had the stable deposits. No one was f folding them up, even though they had no equity left. And then, of course, you had a spectacular bank failure soon after when Greek debt was restructured. So my sense is there is a really bad possibility of coming out of this, which is to backstop everything and actually not restore the capital of the banks at the same time. Because I can guarantee you that the banks which have already been eroded, if you weaken their franchise, they are not, if, if, you, uh, if you stabilize their deposit franchise, businesses are not going to come back to them. They are going to switch to the safest banks in any case. So the only thing left for them would be to then take a punt on interest rates even further and then you'll only have more spectacular banking failure down the line. So that's my real worry that we are hurtling towards a situation in which we are not talking about recapitalizing banks on the liability side. We are saying, let's backstop creditors. Banks will then suddenly do the right thing. Uh, historical evidence suggests that banks without enough equity capital, when all their debts are guaranteed, actually that's the worst kind of a bank you can have in the system. They will bet their liabilities on the risks that are available. You'll have spectacular bank failures, and then you just get into this trap more and more. So I think, to me, a bigger risk than credit crunch is actually zombie lending in the economy, which is you, are just, you just have these banks. They, they lend to the worst firms. Sectors are declining, and yet they keep rolling over their uh, loans to them. Or, or they bet even big on interest rate risk in the next 12 months. I think that's the real risk we should avoid, in my view. Yeah, I, I, I could see both of those things happening, actually, which would be even worse. And what we, thought, what we saw in Japan and other places where there are zombie banks is that the regulators allowed them to pretend and extend. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that, that perpetuated the problem. Um, speaking of franchises, we mentioned uh, a couple of times commercial real estate lending. And we've just come through the pandemic um, in which we find that in spite of the fact the best efforts of corporate America to get people to come back to offices, the offices are still uh, empty. Now, that hasn't caused huge problems so far. But we've seen that the value of real estate investment trusts has gone down. Blackstone, among others, has had to gate uh, some of its REITs uh, and its real estate funds. Um, and we also see that uh, these are old data, but in 2021, community banks had less than 12% of banking industry's assets, but 29% of CRE loans. So they are particularly exposed to that, and that might have geographical implications for places in which community banks uh, are uh, at risk. And up to uh, $1.5 trillion of those loans has to be rolled over in the next three years or refinanced. So there's a real question there. Which comes back, I think, to Viral's point about strengthening the parts of the system that are, are that need to be strengthened. Um, and um, but if there are particular issues there, that could be the catalyst for uh, you know for problems. Do you agree, Alexi and Toma? So uh, I, I would just mention a couple of things. First, I think um, a lot of commercial real estate is actually not offices. I, I, I agree with you about offices, but um, there's a lot of commercial real estate and things like multifamily. And, and other things that we need more of. So if we have a credit crunch in that, I mean, who wants fewer apartments to be built in, given our housing shortage? Um, I, I, I would also say that um, um, the, the reason um, I, I focus on that one is because it's long-term fixed rate lending. Uh, and actually, firms use it also not just for real estate. Uh, I think research shows that firms borrow against their real estate often to do their regular business activities. And so a credit crunch in that would be painful, even if uh, we don't need more offices. That, that's kind of my concern. Um, and, and it's, uh, uh, of, of course, if there's a further shock to, you know, um, if firms can't produce um, because they can't borrow, um, th then I think that actually complicates the Fed's job. It's not all through demand, aggregate demand, the credit Absolutely. crunch is transmitted. It might also create supply problems, like like we had a couple years ago. Hopefully not, but but it, it's another way in which the Fed's job becomes much more complicated if we have a credit crunch. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you want to bring down inflation, you want to tame demand without killing supply. And uh, you know, if you cut credit to investment, be it via uh, commercial real estate, which again, as Alexi very important pointed out, sometimes they take a mortgage, but that's to finance uh, capital expenditure, or just uh, you know, classic. Uh, uh, CNI loans, you don't want that to drop 
because then you lose both the activity and the increase in supply, so it doesn't help you that much to fight inflation. So I think that's the, that's the, the key for the Fed. Um, I mean, I think the, I'm not too pessimistic on that front, I have to say, because I think the, I don't think it's, a, I think that crisis is a lot simpler to uh, deal with than the one we had in 08, just because it's pretty transparent. It's, there's, not a, there's not much issue about figuring out where the losses are. We know where they are, and you know, it's not unheard of, it's nothing new to, to some extent. We have a couple of minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, do we have any? If, if there are, please go to the microphone uh, in the middle of the room. Uh, just excuse me, I have to teach at 6 p.m., so I need to get to oh, yeah, class. That's right. <laughs> um, I uh, work for a very large um, SIFI, very large global bank. And whenever the bank has issued an MRIA or an MRA, we address it immediately. That's the whole thing. And the supervisors are on us. You know, you're given a time period in which you've got to address this. And there's follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. I, we don't know yet, but you know, reading the New York Times yesterday, there seems to have been a, a huge problem there. Any ideas why that was allowed or how that happened? Or I think we're going to find out. I don't. We know that uh, there was apparently, uh, you know, a, a move towards supervisory laxity in the previous administration. There are some anecdotes about that that were also published in the mm -hmm. uh, in the various papers. Um, you know, be kind to the banks, uh, sort of an extreme way of characterizing it. Uh, but, you know, as, as we're all indicated, sometimes the supervisors and regulators are captured. We've seen that in the past. However, sometimes even the most diligent supervisor, you know, might want to look at both sides of the issue and study it. Um, and, you know, studying it often is not what needs to happen. What needs to happen, as you just said, you know, if there's a matter requiring attention, it needs to be addressed very quickly because markets typically don't wait. Mm -hmm. There's a fellow behind you who, wants okay, it, who yeah. has a question. Okay, actually, I had the same, uh, same kind of question. Uh, it, was, it seems to me like there's a weakness in the supervisory thing. It took a year, it seems to me, that you know, SVB was aware of that there was an issue. So we, maybe the solution is to expedite that and possibly like farm out the enforcement to some insurance entity uh, that will be more motivated to act on this, uh, you know, the bad numbers and so on. Well, you know, there are proposals uh, and we the government do it in other jurisdictions actually for bail innable bonds uh, yeah, that convert to um, that convert to equity in the event of distress. So that takes the burden off the taxpayer and puts it on the investors. Now, what just happened in Switzerland, and maybe Tomah can talk about this, is they issued eligible bonds, so-called AT1 uh, bonds for uh, Credit Suisse, but the Swiss government, apparently there was an exception that allowed them to um, wipe out the bondholders and still and not wipe out the equity holders. That's going to create problems for this type of security, but in principle, that type of security provides the kind of insurance or self-insurance, if you will, for the institution that should be there. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you have two different things. One is um, to make sure the regulators have to move quickly in the banks. So there, there's a difference between supervision, where it's a bit discretionary by nature, you know, because it's a, it's a judgment call about, I mean, the thing at SVB is everything was dysfunctional. So, you know, it's like, you know, you couldn't make it up. Like, they didn't have a real risk officer, they didn't have an asset liability management, they all there. Uh, compliance system were deficient, so you know it's like a basket case. But even without going to that extreme, if it's under supervision, where it's a discussion about whether what you do is appropriate or not, that you know that can drag on. If it's a regulation that says you have to satisfy that ratio or I shut you down, it's a lot easier. So I'm in favor of the first one because then there is no time to discuss. You have to satisfy the ratio, and I think for liquidity, that's more or less what we do, and it works. Now the second thing is to get market signal, which is what you were alluding to. And so there, the idea was uh, post-crisis, we would uh, buffer, like increase the amount of equity, uh, like standard common shareholder, but also create uh, 
another tier of capital, this, uh, this, this is like subordinated debt or convertible debt. Yep. And the idea was that these, these guys investing in this, which typically would be insurance companies or hedge funds, um, they are the smart people in the room and they would help us monitor the system because they would be first in line um, in case of a crisis. Therefore, you could sort of trust them for the due diligence. Okay. And I think the evidence is mixed. And I'm going to give you two, two pieces of evidence. The first thing is, if you look at the equity, uh, the shares of uh, SVB, you know who increased a lot their exposure to SVB equity, bought a lot of SVB equity in the last quarter of 2022? Hedge funds. So the idea that the smart guys are going to help you monitor, that doesn't look too good from that perspective. So macro hedge fund and quant hedge fund increased a lot their exposure to SVB in the last quarter of 2022. So that's not great for that. The other thing that we saw in, uh, in the case of Credit Suisse, and that is, again, I mean, it's a mixed bag. Um, you would hope these um, you know, large entities to help you monitor the banks. The problem is sometimes it's complicated. And what we saw in the case of Credit Suisse is even this guy didn't actually read the small print in the contract because it did say that if the bank was not put into resolution but sold as a going concern, they could wipe out these guys before the equity holders. That's what they did. And all the holders of, not all, but many of the holders of 81s woke up saying, well, I didn't know that. So again, the, so my sense is that um, there is no perfect system. Um, and um, the idea that you can trust everything on market monitoring, no. The idea that you can trust everything on the supervisors, no. I would really want a system where you balance the two. Um, and I think that's what we should be aiming for. Yeah, so just to sum up, you know, we had failures in SVB that were market failures, we had risk management failures, we had supervisory, and we had regulatory failures. And last but not least, we had governance failures. So all those things need to work together to make sure that we can have a financial system that is resilient and strong. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.